Hello, my name is Jackie and welcome back to my channel and in this video I'm going to be using Story Engineering by Larry Brooks to plot my book for NaNoWriMo. Now this is the third plotting experiment I've tried. At the beginning of the month I used Take Your Pants Off by Libby Harker, then I used Save the Cat by Blake Snyder and now this is the third and final one for the month which hopefully I will finish in time for NaNoWriMo because that is starting in six days. Now I actually first read Story Engineering in 2016 I believe and when I read it it was revolutionary for me. Now before that I'd actually already written a book called Book Blueprint How Any Entrepreneur Can Write an Awesome Book and it's all about how to outline a non-fiction book. It's predominantly used for how-to books and because of that I knew the power of outlining, I knew the power of plotting essentially. I know that if you have something mapped out in advance, when you actually sit down to write, the writing process becomes so much easier because you're not scrambling for inspiration or turning to Google or wasting time. The problem was that I didn't really know how people plotted fiction books. I actually thought it was impossible. I thought the people who plotted, they simply already had the entire story mapped down in their heads and writing down an outline was just the first step before they started writing but I couldn't see how it would work for someone who didn't already have the story in their head and then I read this book and the section on plotting was eye-opening for me. What Larry Brooks does is he breaks each story into four parts and then he has specific events that need to happen at different percentages throughout the book. And what I realized was, one, there is actually a formula, there is a system that works and that good stories follow. And two, because I was traveling at the time and reading on my Kindle, I was able to see the little percentage progress number at the bottom of the screen. And I could see which part we were up to according to this structure. So if I saw it was like 70% and it felt like things were ramping up, I'm like, yes, right on schedule, we're going towards the climax. If it was 25% and something had just happened, I'm like, okay, here's where the plot's actually starting. This is when things will start to spiral. Around the 50% point, I'd look for how things would shift so the protagonist would start bec to become more active rather than reactionary. So this whole concept was revolutionary for me. Having said that, I also found the book very tiresome to read. So in my Save the Cat video, I mentioned that I found that book really enjoyable. I thought it was straight to the point. There were some funny anecdotes and personal stories, but they were kept to a minimum. Most of the content was really, this is what you need to do and this is how you do it. Whereas this book, I found there was, there was a lot of meandering. Uh, some parts actually felt more academic than usable and all in all, I thought it could have been a half, maybe a third of the current length. So it was a bit of a frustrating read. The good news is that when I was going through it again for this challenge, because I had already read it a couple of years ago, I could just skim through it very quickly and just put in my post-its for key bits I wanted to refer back to. So what does story engineering cover? So it is a novel writing approach that covers the six core competencies of successful storytelling. And these are concept, character, theme, plot, scenes and writing voice. Now when it comes to what you can plan for ahead of time, for me the first four things are the ones I'm going to be focusing on. So concept, character, theme and plot, and maybe a little bit of the scene advice that Larry mentioned in the book. However I think once you get the plot outlined that's really the core piece of preparation. When it comes to writing voice I do agree that it's an important competency to master and that every author should find their voice or at least should find a voice that's not going to distract from the story you're telling. However, I do feel like that's much more of a writing and editing consideration than it is a planning consideration, so I won't be looking at it in this video. Just like I did in the last few videos on Take Your Pants Off and Save the Cat, I'm going to be focusing on the same three ideas and I'm going to be looking at them from the beginning again. So I'm not going to be building on what I already did with those books, I'm going to be starting with a blank slate. If this is the first time you're joining me, the three ideas were Powerless, which is a story about 
a girl in a family of superheroes who doesn't have any powers and she's basically kicked out and told not to come back until she, until she finds her powers. Vampire Board Games, which is a story about a family of maybe vampires, maybe just some sort of immortal beings who have been trapped in the same house for centuries because there is some enemy outside. Um, the youngsters in the family, because they're bored, have set up the entire mansion as like this interactive board game where they can level up and best each other and they decide to add defeating the enemy into the game. And the third idea is called Happily Ever After and it's about a villain who dies and gets sentenced to hell and he decides he wants to take over heaven. So first step for each of these will be concept. So according to Larry Brooks in Story Engineering, the first core competency of storytelling is concept. Now, one of the things he does say in this book is that you can start with any of the six competencies, so there's no need to start with concept at the beginning, but because these were how they were laid out in the book, that's the order I'll be taking them in. Now, I'm not 100% sure what he means by concept. Based on the book and what I've read, I think it is the what if question that your book answers. However, however, I don't feel it's defined very clearly. And this is one of the challenges I had with the book when I mentioned earlier that it did feel very academic to me when I was reading it. So if I go to the section on concept, in the concept define chapter, he says, defining concept is tricky because in the lexicon of the writing world, it is both overused and misused and therefore often misunderstood. The confusion stems from the fact that concept is, sometimes subtly, a different essence than an idea or even a premise. And it is very different from theme, which is a common source of confusion on this issue. So all well and good. We understand that the idea of concept is confusing and a lot of people get it wrong. The problem is he doesn't clearly define it after that. So the clearest part of the discussion on concept I found was that a concept is an idea that has been evolved to the point where the story becomes possible. A concept becomes a platform, a stage upon which a story may unfold. A concept is something that asks a question. The answer to that question is your story. And then the next part of the discussion gives some examples. So the first example it gives is the idea to write a story about ballet dancers is not a concept. It is just an idea. But when you add a forward thinking realm to that idea and do it in the form of a question, what if a ballet dancer loses her leg at the knee, but perseveres against great prejudice to become a professional dancer, you have evolved the idea into the realm of conceptualization. So with that and the other examples he covers, I think the concept is the what if question. Now, once you have that question, he lists a number of different criteria that your concept needs to address in order to be a good one. These are, is the concept fresh and original? And if it's not fresh and original, does it give a new spin to an old idea? The next one is, does it set the stage for an unfolding dramatic story? So if we assume that I'm on the right track with the what if question, I'm pretty confident that I can come up with a concept. Whether it's a good one is debatable. So let's see how I go. So I've given the concept a try, but before I read out what I have, I want to explain that I actually had a little more, I actually have a little more context for these exercises outside of the book. And the reason for that is because when I first heard about story engineering and Larry Brooks and got into this stuff, I actually came across his blog before I read the book. And I found the blog to be a really useful resource. I actually found it to be a bit more focused than the book actually is. So if, um, if you're looking to get into this method, I, I recommend buying the book simply because it's nice to support authors. But I also recommend checking out the blog because there's a lot there. Now, the reason I bring that up is because there was a discussion on concept on the blog. And Larry mentioned that it was one of the hardest things for his students to get their head around. And one of the things he said was that concept is what makes your book conceptual. So not the most ideal definition because you're using the same word to define it. But when I heard that, I sort of went, oh, so there's like an idea or theory or concept behind the book rather than just 
you know, the character and plot and so on. So when I look at my three what if questions, I think two of them don't actually work, but one of them does from a more conceptual standpoint. So what I have is for powerless, what if a girl grows up in a family of superheroes but doesn't have powers? So it is a what if question. It's not very conceptual though. Vampire board games. I have what if a family of vampires was locked up in the same house for 200 years or what if a family was cut off from the outside world for 200 years. Um, again, it's a what if question. It's accurate for the story I want to write, but not really conceptual. However, for Happily Ever After, the what if I've got is what if there was a heaven and hell for storybook heroes? So that isn't actually related to the plot or the specific character I'm going to be writing about. It's a question about this world and there is a concept to this world, the concept that there is a heaven and hell for, for storybook heroes. I have no idea if what I'm saying is making any sense, but I think if I was to submit this to Larry Brooks and say these are my concepts, he'd say they probably all need work, but he'd say the happily ever after one hits the mark, it is conceptual, the other two don't. So hopefully that was helpful. Now fortunately one of the things Larry says is that if your concept isn't great, it isn't the end of the world. And in fact, there is an exercise section towards the end of the chapter where there are a list of points you need to do. So write down the idea for your story, evaluate it as a concept, evaluate your concept again, is it original and fresh? And then the next one is, if your concept is precisely what you want, yet it isn't anything anyone would call original com or compelling, what is your plan for the other core competencies that will compensate for it and elevate your story to a level that is original and compelling? So what that means is that I don't need to throw out the idea for powerless or vampire board games. I just need to make sure that the theme, the character, the structure and the other core competencies are good enough that they make up for the lack of concept. Now, the next core competency is character. What is interesting about this book is that each competency doesn't get the same amount of real estate. So concept only gets three chapters and that's 15 pages. I'm looking at the table of contents to make sure I'm not lying to you. Whereas character has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight chapters over 52 pages. And then when you get into structure, that's almost a hundred pages. So I think it's 80 pages with 20 chapters in it. So I feel a little bit torn about this. On one hand, I love that the ideas of character and structure are really being explored in depth. On the other hand, it, as, a, as someone who's written and edited nonfiction, I look at this and go, well, if all six of these competencies are so important, then all six of them should have similar real estate in the book. They should take up a similar amount of space. By giving so much time in the book to just one of the competencies, you're basically saying it's more important than all of the others. And I don't think that's Larry Brooks's intention, but that as a reader, when you think about how much time you're spending with each idea, that's definitely what's going to happen. Having said that though, some exercises and activities take longer than others. While concept might be difficult to get right, it is just one sentence and it requires more thinking than anything else to get that sentence written, whereas structure is potentially going to be several pages of outlining. So I can see why he's done it that way, but it's just a little nitpicky thing. Anyway. Back to character. So what he covers in the book is the fundamental essence of character, which is seven key variables you need to address. So that's surface affectations and personality, backstory, character arc, inner demons and conflict, worldview, goals and motivations, then decisions, actions and behavior. After that, the rest of the discussion is very academic and theoretical. And when I went through it the other night, um, I found some of it interesting, but most of it was talking about the different ways this could be implemented and the different ways this could show up. So there's a chapter on interior versus exterior conflict. However, inner demons and conflicts is already covered in those seven key elements of character and exterior conflict is going to be covered in structure and plot when you get to it. So in terms of doing this as an exercise, the main thing to focus on is these seven key variables and then the later chapters can come if you want more context or background for any of these areas. 
So I've now been through the seven character elements for the protagonist for all three of the book ideas and I'm actually surprised by how much I knew given that neither of the previous uh, plotting methods had a lot of emphasis on all these character bits and pieces. So you'll see I have about three quarters of a page, maybe a bit more for Powerless and Vampire board games. And then things are a little bit lighter for Happily Ever After, so probably not going to be looking at that one for NaNoWriMo this year. Now beyond discovering that I already knew a lot of this stuff, which was a very pleasant surprise, there were a couple of things I really liked about this process. So I felt like I already knew their surface affectations and personalities. I knew their backstory with the exception of Happily Ever After because I haven't even thought about that. And I knew their character arc and I need to thank Take Your Pants Off for that because that was a big focus. What I liked developing was inner demons and conflicts and worldview because I think I'd already thought about their motivations but I hadn't thought about what was what was motivating those motivations or what was powering those motivations because our goals and motivations often come out of our worldview or our inner conflicts so it's either what's going on in here that we want to fix or address or it's what's happening out there that we either want to fix or address or run away from so that was really interesting the other thing that i liked is that the piece seven in this character outline is decisions actions and behaviors and the way larry frames it is what do they do because of all of the above so you can actually start thinking about plot points here because everything they do in the plot should actually relate to all of the stuff that you've outlined and what was good was that even though I haven't been checking my notes from Save the Cat or Take Your Pants Off while doing this, I do still have a lot of the work in my head. So I remember I remember the ideas I have for the book. I remember um, some of the things that I want to have happen. And what was good was that in for some characters, so in vampire board games, the decisions, actions and behaviours actually line up with everything I wrote down. So the fact that she's so competitive, it means she takes stupid risks, it's what sets the whole plot in motion. However, I also found the opposite was true, so for Powerless, I always knew she was desperate for her father's approval and desperate to fit in with her family, but when I got into more of how that led to inner conflict and how that affected her worldview, there were things like being constantly worried about what others think, questioning her own judgment, and also a lack of trust for the outside world. And that is actually going to affect the plot because in this story, she gets kicked out and has to confront the outside world. And in the beat sheet that I did for Save the Cat, I know that she ended up coming into contact with another group and becoming one of them. And the battle was more about her getting them to trust her Whereas the truth is that she's probably not going to trust them at all based on everything else I've said about her character. So that's something really interesting to keep in mind. The next story competency is theme and Larry describes this as what your book is about without describing like the character or plot. So rather than saying it's about a guy who does X, Y and Z, it's about racial inequality or world hunger or I don't know, um, finding your own inner strength. So the good news is that I'd already thought of themes last week and uh, oh, I suppose I should be good though and look at the exercise so just give me a minute. Okay, the good news is that there are no exercises in the theme section of this book. So I mentioned earlier how the different competencies were quite uneven. Context only had three chapters. Theme also only has three chapters as opposed to structure, which has 20. So if you're looking for more content on themes, you might be disappointed, but this is really good for me because I already looked at themes when I was doing Save the Cat, so I don't need to do anything else now. So the themes I had were Powerless is the importance of self-acceptance. Vampire board games is we're all in prisons of our own making. And Happily Ever After is either does everyone deserve a Happily Ever After? Or we're all responsible for our own Happily Ever Afters. So, quick win there. 
Now it's about 4 p.m. in October in Estonia, which means I'm almost out of natural light for the day. So I'm going to call it a day and come back tomorrow to look at the four part structure for all three of my ideas. So I'm back and today is plotting day and I am so excited to jump back into this plotting method. So Larry Brooks recommends a four part structure to books. These are four equal parts, so 25% each. Part one is the setup, part two is the response, part three is the attack, and part four is the resolution. And within those parts, there are a number of milestones that he also lists out in the book. So they are the first plot point, the first pinch point, the midpoint, the second pinch point, and the second plot point. So I'm going to go through this in an inverted triangle structure rather than working from what would be the beginning of a plot to the end of the plot. So the first thing to look at are the four parts. Now what I really like about this structure is that each of these parts has a very defined purpose and that can help influence the scenes that you include in them and definitely the mood and pacing and flavour of those scenes. So part one, which is about the first 25% of the book, is the setup. The goals of this section are to create stakes for your main character, to share their backstory, to build empathy with the character, to potentially foreshadow conflict, and to bring your character to a point where they are ready to transition into the book, the plot that's to come. Part two is called the response. And this is where the character is responding to or reacting to the event that kicked off the main plot of the book. So if you think about like an action film or movie, there might have been an explosion or some sort of attack. And this is where the main characters are just running to get the hell out of there. And everywhere they turn, the bad guys are still coming out of them. So in this part of the book, they don't really have any agency. It's purely about responding to or reacting to what has already happened. Part three is then called the attack, and this is where the hero becomes a hero. This is where they get proactive. So generally something will change at the midpoint of the book, so something between part two and part three, and that'll give the hero new information or a new take on the current situation that he can then use to fight back. The final part is the resolution. So this is when the problem is solved, the bad guys are defeated, and the hero is able to either return to their life from before this adventure or they build a new life based on what they've learned. So in part four, you are not supposed to give any new information. Everything that the hero should know to solve the problem, everything that the audience needs to know to solve the problem should have already been communicated by the time you get to part four. The hero needs to resolve the story. They should be the catalyst for finding the solution. And ideally, the hero will experience personal growth that will help him find the solution, solve the problem, kill the bad guy, etc. Now, within these four parts, there are what Larry calls milestone scenes. And these are important scenes that need to take place at certain times in your story in order for the story to work. So these are the first plot point, the midpoint, the second plot point, the first pinch point and the second pinch point. There are also a couple of other scenes he mentions, such as the opening scene, the opening hook, but these don't get as much airtime in the book. Um, they are also not assigned specific locations in the book, so I'm just going to focus on the ones that he really focuses on. So the first plot point takes place at the 20 or 25% mark of your book. This is the event that kicks the whole story into gear. So everything before this is set up, your first plot point happens, and then you enter act two, which is when the hero is reacting. So it's also the transition piece between part one and part two. The goal of this point is to introduce the main conflict of the book and to get the action started. Now, Larry actually distinguishes between the first plot point and an inciting incident, because each of these had different purposes. And I will just find uh, the example he gives in the book because it is a very good one. So an inciting incident is something that is something that happens that might start to move the plot along. It might be 
a hook or something exciting or something that changes the worlds for the characters, but it doesn't actually kick the plot in motion. Um, usually it is a setup for the first plot point. So the example he gives is from Thelma and Louise. If you haven't seen it, two women shoot and kill a guy they've met in a bar after he comes on too strong once they reach the parking lot. Now what Larry says in the book is that this moment looks just like a first plot point, but because of where it happens in the story and how it doesn't meet the criteria for a first plot point, it isn't one. It's an inciting incident. So it's an inciting incident because it incites what happens next. It's a huge total game changer. So the first reason he gave for it not being the first plot point is the position in the story. So as I mentioned earlier, the first plot point should happen between 20 and 25% of the way through your story. In Thelma and Louise, which is just over two hours in length, the first plot point should happen around the 30 minute mark. This incident where, I don't remember which one's which, so I'm sorry if I get this wrong, but where Thelma shoots the guy, that happens at 19 minutes and 30 seconds, so it's actually too soon to have that role in the story. The next piece he said is it doesn't fulfill the function of the first plot point. It's an inciting incident because it incites what happens next. So in the movie, it incites a 10 minute discussion where the women go back to the bar and discuss what, have, what happened and what they should do next. Now, although the shooting forever changed their lives, and although it launched them down a new path, it is not the first plot point because the shooting wasn't what chose the path. So the shooting could have led to a number of different events. It could have led to them, I don't know, killing themselves. It could have led to them turning themselves in. It didn't lead to either of those things. Instead, it led to a discussion and the discussion is what led to the rest of the movie. The discussion is what led to them deciding to make a run for it. So that discussion and that decision at the end of the discussion is what the first plot point is, rather than the moment where she shoots the guy. The next essential piece is the midpoint, which unsurprisingly happens at the 50% mark of your book. This is between part two, the response, and part three, the attack. So when you think about its position in the book, it needs to include new information or some sort of twist that allows the hero to move from being a completely reactionary person, someone who can only respond to what's being thrown at him, to being a proactive force in the book. So that's the main criteria. It should completely shift the story. One of the analogies Larry gives in the book is that your first plot point, midpoint, and second plot point are like three poles holding a tent up. So if you imagine a tent like this, the midpoint is when things turn around. The most important thing here is that the new information should change the meaning of what's happening for the hero and it should change it in a way that empowers the hero because this is what enables him to be proactive. The next big event is the second plot point which is at 75% of the way through the book and this is the big climax. This is where the hero resolves whatever has gone wrong, whatever has fallen apart and puts it all back together. Now once you have your four parts in order, those three transitional pillars are the main foundations of your plot. However, there are two other major milestones Larry talks about in the book, and these are called pinch points. So there are two pinch points, one is in the middle of part two, and one is in the middle of part three. So if you want to go percentage-wise, I think that's 37.5% and 62.5%. And these moments are both designed to remind the audience of the antagonist or the antagonistic force that's at play. So it helps keep stakes up, tension high, and so on. Now there are a couple of things I really love about this plotting approach. One is the percentage breakdown. So no matter how long or short your book is, you can apply it to what you're working with. Two is that each part of the book, so each of those four parts has a clear purpose and that helps define what goes into each of those parts. And the next one is that everything feels very necessary. So even though I really liked Save the Cat and I really liked the beat sheet, there were a couple of pieces that felt like they were placeholders. So there's the fun and games section in Act 2, which Blake Snyder describes as everything you see in the trailer. So it's everything, everything fun that goes into the trailer of the book. And then there's Bad Guys Close In, which is also in Act 2. Now, in the beat sheet, both of these took up a large number of pages, but there wasn't a lot of guidance for what should go in there other than it should be entertaining. Whereas this, I feel like every single one of these milestone scenes helps 
create tension and it helps move the story forward. So now I've got to try and replot each of my books using this approach. So I've been through Larry's structure and I've attempted to replot each of these books and there are a couple of things that are interesting. One is that because of the work I've already done, especially with Save the Cat, these outlines are a lot shorter than the Save the Cat one. And that's not because there isn't that much information in them, it's just that I didn't need to do the exploratory work. A lot of that's already been done. So that's really cool. The second thing is seeing whether these stories stack up when I put them into this percentage four part structure. And what I found is that what I have for Powerless works pretty well, although there are a couple of questions where I've asked myself, ooh, is this necessary or could I make this more relevant? And the same thing actually happened with Vampire Board Games. So I had a first plot point in mind, which was where the main character like goes outside and attempts to confront the enemy for the first time. But because of the way Save the Cat is structured, there wasn't really any lasting aftermath of that. There was her getting in trouble with her family, but it was sort of a scene and that was it. Whereas according to Larry Brooks' structure, that should inform all of part two. Part two should be entirely in response to that. So having that in mind is actually making me rethink how, how this book actually works and what's relevant and what's not. So again, loving this approach. The place I ran into trouble was Happily Ever After, where I actually couldn't get past the opening scene and the initial hook. I wasn't sure what the first plot point should be, or the midpoint. <laughs> so after setup, I wasn't actually sure what the focus for each of the four parts should be. I wasn't sure how part two would be a response. I wasn't sure how part three would be an attack. And even though I technically know how it's resolved in the end, I didn't feel comfortable writing that down without having anything in the middle. So it's going to be really interesting this week when I try to combine all three methods to see if I get any further with that book. However, at this stage, I'm thinking Happily Ever After is not the book I will be doing for Nano. It will be either Powerless or Vampire Board Games. Now, the last two competencies to address are scenes and voice. I think I mentioned in the introduction to this video that I wasn't going to look at voice because I think that is a writing and editing concern. It's not really a plotting and preparation concern. When it comes to scenes, I did think it would be useful to look at this. However, in hindsight, I feel like it is more useful as a checklist type of tool rather than a coming up with ideas for scenes type of tool. And the reason is because there are two main things Larry talks about in the scenes discussion. The first one is that every scene should have a mission, and that mission is to move the story forward. So basically there should be no filler scenes or fluff or something that's in there just because you want to or, you know, you want to see the characters in this funny or strange situation. If it doesn't move the story forward, it doesn't belong in the book. And I find this really interesting, especially when I think about Save the Cat. Fun and Games, which I mentioned earlier, you could argue that that's not really moving the story forward, that's just having fun and games. The next thing he talks about is the cut and thrust technique. So this is a technique which means that every scene should finish in a way that creates an itch the reader wants to scratch, or it raises a question they want to answer. Essentially, this means they will want to turn over to the next page and keep reading. And that goes for whether your reader is an editor or a beta reader or a literary agent or the end person who's buying your book. So in the book, he actually demonstrates this by giving examples of the final sentence or the final few sentences from a number of scenes in one of his books. So if I read some of these to you. He would write it for Lauren to honor her memory. The consequences of blasphemy be damned. Lauren led him out of the cave, stepping through the stone archway into what would prove to be an altered reality for them both. So if you look at those couple of examples, you have, I assume the first one's about writing a eulogy or something, and he said he would write it, the consequences of blasphemy be damned. So rather than just, you know, he was planning to write the eulogy, it's like, it introduces consequences and stakes and makes the reader wonder, what sort of consequences is he talking about? And what's he talking about with blasphemy? What exactly is he going to say? And that makes you want to go to the next scene. With the second one I read, which was she led him out of the cave and stepping into what would prove to be an altered reality for them both. What does that mean? How is taking a step through this archway going to change their reality? Again, it raises a question that the reader wants to answer. So I think 
In terms of planning, obviously I'm not going to have the last line of every single scene written at this stage of the process. However, I think this is interesting to keep in mind at this stage just to see what ideas come up and also because if you think about it before you start writing, that means it's going to be front of mind when you do start writing and hopefully it's a technique that you can use effectively. So I've now gone through the first four of Larry Brooks' six core competencies that he covers in Story Engineering. And I think I've pretty much been sharing my thoughts on the process the whole way through, but to sum up, I think the plotting approach in this book is brilliant. So if you're someone who struggles with outlining, or if you are someone who has written a book that you don't think it's working and you're not sure why, then I highly recommend buying this book simply because seeing how a story should be mapped out, so knowing what should be covered in each of the four parts and knowing what should happen at each of the key events and when they should happen in your book might be really helpful because you might realise, oh, the event that I wanted to kick off the plot actually happens way too early and there's not enough setup, which means we don't really have any relationship with the character before things move forward. Or maybe you realise Although there is an interesting event in the middle of the book, it doesn't perform the function of a midpoint. It doesn't actually change anything for the character, which is why the middle of the book is lagging. So I think it can be really helpful from both a planning as well as a revision perspective. Other than that, I did struggle with this as a reading experience. I did feel like the book was very academic in some places. I feel like it was almost like Larry was doing lectures and then had them transcribed. And I think when you're standing in front of a classroom or you're doing a presentation, then then you can go off on tangents and then you can wax lyrical about your philosophy and what you think. But for me at least, when I'm reading a book that's supposed to be a practical guide, I'm for the most part already sold on what you're teaching me. So you can give me a brief explanation of why it's important, but Mostly the reason I bought this book is because I want to learn how to do what you teach. And that doesn't mean I need all of the rambling that comes beforehand. So I did find it a little bit frustrating as a reader from that perspective. However, once you've read it once, then you can do what I did, which is just skim through it really quickly to find the parts you need. I also found the character discussion useful, especially the seven different elements your characters should address. And this is something that wasn't really covered in either of the other planning methods I approached, so it was a lot of fun to delve a bit deeper with my characters. Another thing I liked about this was the idea of a concept. Even though it is very theoretical, I think that thinking about the bigger concept behind your book can help create a better book. It can help create something that comments on a larger theme or introduces a larger idea than simply bringing a new character or bringing a new story to the world might. I'm not sure my books will do that, but it is something I'd like to think about as I grow and learn as a writer. And finally, the piece on scenes that I just shared with you at the end of the process, I thought that was very clever. One, of course, every scene should have a mission, it should move the story forward, if it doesn't, cut it. But two, also that idea of every scene should raise a question in your reader's mind to make them want to read the next one. Now, in reality, I'm not sure if every single one of my scenes will do that. I know there's the potential for that to get a bit tiresome if you do it every single time. So if there are 40 scenes in your book and there are 40 different questions you're making the reader ask themselves to keep them reading, then that's probably going to lose its effectiveness after a while. However, I can see the benefit of using that, if not through the entire book, at select occasions. So all in all, I thought that story engineering is a really useful tool. I highly recommend it, especially if you want help with your plot. So from here, my final activity for Preptober 2019 is going through all of the materials I've put together after reading Take Your Pants Off, Save the Cat and Story Engineering and seeing how I can put them together into a master plan, which I'll then use to choose which book idea I'll be working on in the coming month. So I'm hoping that'll be up in the next few days, ideally before NaNoWriMo starts. If you're interested in seeing that, please remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell to make sure you see it. Other than that, good luck with your own NaNoWriMo preparation and I'll see you in a few days. Bye.